listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts. Intelligent Talk. Hey folks, happy Tuesday. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to my show, the Intrepid Radio Program, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com. Come on over, see all the goodness that's Odyssey Radio. And at the same time, you can come over and view the video simulcast over on my YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. And the best thing about the YouTube channel is not just looking at my mug talking, but it is joining the live chat room that's going on over there right now of all the intrep heads. So join up. Uh, you can. You don't even have to talk. You can just uh, join the chat room, watch what everybody's saying about everything else, and you'll note that there are lots of conversations and side conversations that go on over in that YouTube channel. So come on over, join, add your two cents worth, or just be a voyeur and watch everybody else talk. That's over on the YouTube channel. And while you're there, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the little bell, you'll get notifications of this show every day, and also you can hit the join button. And the join button should be at the bottom of this video. If it's not appearing there, it's because YouTube has slammed me with yet again another uh, uh, copyright in infringement, violation of some kind of hit, uh, when it's not a copyright violation at all. They just have an automated system set up, and every day it nails me for the same two pieces of music, the opening music and the end music, which is used for the middle section of the show as well. And uh, it's I've already owned the license for that. I've paid for it, uh, so uh, I shouldn't be getting the hit, but their service uh, hits it every day anyway. And so there's a couple of them they've cleared and a couple of them and a bunch of them they haven't. So if you don't see the join button, that means this has a copyright hit against it until they figure out that yes, it is indeed the same music that I've paid for and that they've already cleared on other videos. Uh, so you can resolve that by, if you go into the description of this show, you're going to see a link that says that you can go over and uh, hit the join button to become a member of this channel. Uh, there are other places you can do that as well. You can go out to the main page in a separate window, and uh, you'll see the join button is out there underneath the header on the right-hand side of the page. So there you go. There's all that wonderful information about becoming a member and joining up with the Intrepid Radio Program page. And we'd love to have you go look at the perks that you can get for becoming a member. And I th would say that tomorrow morning we are going to do another members only. That's Wednesday morning. We're going to do another members only coffee chat at 6 a.m. Central. That is 7 a.m. Eastern. That's going to be all the way, as Audrey knows so well, 4 a.m. Central, uh, Central, 4 a.m. Pacific Coast time, and Audrey always seems to be up, so she's always here at 4 a.m. So uh, come on over tomorrow morning for just a lousy cup of coffee at uh, 6 a.m. Central Standard Time, and that's members only. And the only way it opens up is if for some reason YouTube is still not working when it comes to the chat that's supposed to be open chat for members only. And if that doesn't work, we always flip the switch and turn it over to a live chat for everybody involved. So um, there it is. Tomorrow morning, be here. And uh, today, I want to start us off uh, with nothing political. I don't even want to jump into current events in the news. There's still all the same old stuff that is bothersome for some, uh, uh, skippy, yippy, joyful for others. Uh, I would say uh, the whole COVID vaccine thing has a lot of... It seems like there's a lot of problems that are being reported, but that are being suppressed. They don't really want you to hear about that stuff. If you think there is not, let's get to a totally different topic, not even the COVID. If you think there is not news suppression in this country, I think again. I'll play this leg and it'll pull this leg, it'll play Jingle Bells. If you think that there's no, no information suppression that is going on in this country be it for the election, be it for uh, presidential candidates, be it for uh, uh, politicians, be it for political movements, be it for vaccines and viruses and things like that. It goes on, be it for military, be it for anything. It's out there. 
And uh, you guys, uh, you think for yourselves, so most of you should already be well aware of this. So uh, uh, just think as you see some of the headlines coming out, not everything is what you think it is. And uh, now that's maybe one big, fat, juicy, white-butted American conspiracy. But you tell me a time where you think that the government hasn't lied to us before. Let us know what that is, and we'll talk about it. All right, so I want to start with our Spark Courage. 50 Ways to Be Bold. Again, those of you who are new to the show and you haven't heard this before, uh, this is a little matchbox, a, box, a faux matchbox with filled with, guess what, faux matches. They're not real matches, but uh, it's. Uh, I picked this up at a garage sale or the thrift barn or something. Uh, Rainy, where'd I get this? This uh, courage. I think the barn. I think it was the barn. It was over at the barn, the thrift barn, and uh, I got it for like fifty cents, the something heritage like that. Barn. The heritage barn. <laughs> yeah, that's that's when you know we're from the Middle West. You know, you can hear our our you know, hey, we're gonna go over to the thrift barn today. <laughs> okay, don't you know? Uh, so uh, uh, got these at the thrift barn for you know pennies. And uh, we draw from this every day. We're gonna. There's a finite number. There's only 50 of them in here, but I like to draw from these and uh, just extemporaneously see what the heck we we've got for today. Um, okay, this is different. We haven't had this one before. Take a look at that. See if you can read that. Do something alone that you'd normally do with someone else. Ooh, kinky. Huh? <laughs> If you didn't hear that, Rainy was like, ooh, kinky. <laughs> hey, come here, Rainy. Why don't you talk about that one? I don't know. <laughs> what do you got for that one I'm for working. us, Rainy? I'm working over here. I'm working. She's working, so she can only... Well, come business. over and at least say hi while we're at it, since you're yakking I don't away. I know what I look like. You look absolutely amazing. There she is. There's my beautiful wife, Rainy. There she is. Yeah, hi, everybody. <laughs> Uh, uh, she lets me be on the rainy show every yeah. now and then. Welcome to the rainy so. show. Ooh, I'm going to use the camera to look at myself here. Oh. Wow. Oh, yeah, I should probably fix my makeup. Yeah, no, you look beautiful. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, spark courage. I'm going to talk about that. Yeah. Just kind of extemporaneous. Do, do something for yourself alone that you would normally do with somebody else. Ooh. Now, of course, lots of... <laughs> that's where she went. Ooh, kinky. Uh, well, you know, we can all think of those wild crazy things that you could do you know first things that come to mind with us are things that humor us you know we we want to we want to go to prurient places with our minds and uh, so uh but what else is there what kind of thing that makes you bold and makes you courageous what would be something that would make you feel bold and courageous about yourself that you would do by yourself as opposed to something that you would normally do with other people can you mm. think of anything not really. Not really? No, that's a tough one. Okay. What would I do with somebody that I do alone? I don't know. I, I would say, like, uh, um, this is a tougher one. This is probably the one that stumped me the most out of all these that we've done. Yeah. What would I do alone that I would normally do with somebody else that would, in a sense, bolster my boldness and my uh, build my courage up? Uh, might it be, oh, I don't know, uh, walking through a dark wood, you know, at night? There's some people deathly afraid of the dark. And you say, I'd go in there if I had somebody going with me, uh, but uh, why not go it alone sometime? Go alone and uh, not to be unsafe. You can I have your... go to the bathroom by myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just a joke. When have you done that in the last 11 years? Never. <laughs> so, Never. <laughs> since we've had children. You know, we could have a quiet hour in here working on stuff you go... Something's up with the kids. And she goes, I'm going to go check on them, but I'm going to go to the bathroom. For she, as soon as she goes in the bathroom, kids. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, they got to be what there. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What's going on? We, we heard you leave your chair. I got something. Yeah. Well, you left the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, so, I think it's something like that. It's the things that would bolster your courage. What can you think of in your own experience that would be something that you would normally do with somebody else, but now why don't you do it alone? Find yourself doing it by yourself so you can build your boldness and build your courageousness. Maybe it's something about, oh, I don't know, speaking out about something, about something you believe in. That's easy to do when you're with a group or when you're with other people. 
What if you're alone and you got to speak up for yourself? You got to go stand up and go, wait a minute, I got something to say about this. Uh, it doesn't have to be a negative, uh, but uh, it can be something that's uh, worth doing, things that a group would normally do together. It's easy to, and I don't want to use these words in a negative connotation, but it's easier to do things when you're with other people. A mob, look at a positive mob. It's easier to do things when you have a bunch of people that are bolstering and firing up your courage. Uh, as opposed to saying, I, I will take a stand on this particular thing or do this all on my own. Uh, and I'll speak up when I need to speak up. Uh, we used to say, uh, oh, he wouldn't say anything. Uh, he wouldn't say shit if his mouth were full of it. We'd say of, of some people because they can't speak on their own. They can't do their own thing. Um, and sometimes, I don't know. I suppose we can look and find the negative aspects in all of this kind of stuff, but I think the positive aspect is that you're doing, you're doing something, you're building your own courage, uh, you're bolstering your courage and bolstering, and you're you're growing it in a sense. Uh, you're becoming. I used to be deathly afraid to speak in front of people, and uh, I what? could. What? <laughs> I know. What, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> when, when you was were that? Like... A one? <laughs> now, I remember in, in school, like like uh, uh, middle school, high school, doing speech and stuff like that. Oh, I, I dreaded that. I liked it, but I dreaded speaking. I, you know, I could never get the right words to come out and things like that. And so maybe you can extrapolate this over into building your boldness and speaking your truth. Your truth, your mind, uh, the things that you believe in. And uh, having no problems speaking about it. And uh, I try to instill that with our kids and with, with Flynn right now. Because Flynn's at that age where, you know, he's 11 years old. And he's still a little... I, I, I don't want to say Flynn is shy because... Uh, well, shy. He's, he's quiet. quiet. He's a very quiet person. Um, but I would think, and sometimes I say to him, well, like when we'd go out and sell Cub Scout popcorn and stuff like that. You're standing out at a table in front of a Walmart entrance, and you got to talk to people when they come by. If I were to have left it to Flynn, he wouldn't have any sales because he's he just not that kind of person. He doesn't like to speak up. Yep. And, of course, he was he was a kid, 9 and 10 years old when we were doing that. Now he's 11, and, and we run into those, and I'll say, Son, you have the ability. Speak what you believe. Speak what you're thinking. Speak your mind. He doesn't have any problem doing that here. No. That's for sure. If, you, if he doesn't want to do what you ask him to do, you know it, and it's yeah. loud. Why do I got to clean my room? Why do it's I got to do nothing? It's my room. <laughs> it's my room. I'm the one who lives there. You don't got to live in there. You don't. You can stay out of my room. I said, well, bravo for speaking up, but uh, I got a different plan for you. Yep. But uh, what it took with him was sometimes I would say, you know, just use your boldness. Use your courage. Get out there and go, good afternoon, you know, how you doing? I'm selling popcorn, I'll bet you could use some. You know, whatever it might be. Um, now, that's not speaking truth. That's bolstering your courage. And uh, one of the things that um, my friend, Carr Hagerman, um, he was the entertainment director at the Minnesota Renaissance Festival for years, and he practically grew up out there. And uh, he's older than I am by a couple of years, but uh, he's been out there, and he was one of the main characters out there that people would want to see. And uh, he wrote a book about, uh, I don't remember the name of the book, but it incorporated, he said, some of the people who did Renaissance Festival and were out there doing street entertainment were some of the best business people that he knew because they knew how to, it wasn't putting on artifice uh, uh, and falsity, but it was the ability to stand up in front of somebody and say, here's the new product. This is what we're working on. Here's the idea. Here's the platform. And you can switch, turn that over from comedy on the street uh, to a seriousness in business. And so uh, uh, speaking up and doing things that you would normally do with somebody else, only doing them alone, uh, and I, I immediately go to speaking up for yourself. What do you think of? What comes to your mind? You got a chat room over here. You can type in what you think, as I'm sure some of you already did when yeah. Rainey yelled, Kinky! Yeah! <laughs> yeah! Yeah! So uh, that's it. That's it for okay. Courage today. Sorry.
sorry, I'm not more helpful on that. That's topic. all right. It's all right. I'm working on. Get, I'm, I'm working. I'm working you're on working. orders over there. So when you're gonna go work alone on things that you would normally do with other people, just call me. Okay. I'll come over. I will. I'll call you, <laughs> Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have fun. I will. Thank you for your input. You're welcome. Rainy, uh, uh, folks, that was Rainy Roberts, the one and only. And uh, so let's move on. Let's, let's get into talking what we were talking about yesterday, what we've been talking about for a couple of weeks. And that is, uh, well, not a couple of weeks, really. It's only been a week and two days we've been talking about this whole thing of holy language. Sacred language is the way we started out. Uh, the fundamental building stones of creation are language. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to challenge you to say either, if you don't believe there is any kind of a deity, anything, any kind of a superior being, any kind of a divinity, any kind of a... And divinity, by the way, is the quality that we place on some kind of entity or being that's out there or thing, or nebulous logos thing. Um, uh, it's, it's the idea that there's an originator, a creator, and that all that is came to being because there is a universal language. And we're going to talk today about a topic that we've hit before, and that was the division of language. Why are there different languages then? Uh, if, there are, if there was a foundational language that God created, why did he allow language to be divi divided. And of course, what the challenge for you is going to be if you're not a person of faith at all, if you don't have a belief that God did those kinds of things that are written in biblical text, then it's going to be a tough time for you to swallow the concept. So the idea, we were talking yesterday about frequencies, and we were kind of ending up by saying the full scope of this ability and power is if resonating sound was amplified loud enough and long enough, across the land continents of the earth, nature would be forced to obey. And it's also interesting to know that sound travels faster through water and through solid ground than it does through air. And so the science is definitely there. We just don't know enough about it yet, or, or maybe we do. And it's been quelled and suppressed by certain undisclosed high-ranking alliance leaders that work hand-in-hand hand with governmental officials. You know, I was reading a book today. Rainy, would you do me a huge favor? Uh, in the bathroom, on the big stand, there's a little paperback book about uh, 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 something for the weird. Wisdom for the weird, or words for the weird. Or Blessed are the weird. Manifest Blessed are the weird. For creators. I want you to... I was looking at this a little bit this morning. What's that? <laughs> Nope, no poo germs. Right. This was in the bathroom, though. This is the book. I recommend it. Uh, I had read through pieces of this once before for myself because uh, I wanted to see what it was about. But it's called Blessed Are the Weird or Blessed Are the Weird. It's a manifesto for creatives. And uh, it's written by Jacob Nordby, and it's published by, published by, I think it was, uh, it was a weird name, Manifesto Publishing House. So it's Manifesto for Creatives. It's probably self-published. Um, and so I want to read a little bit of this introduction. This is where this fits in, this whole thing. Now, this is going to be, you think it's weird for some people to be able to understand and believe that there is a God that's out there, an infinite being, a creator, an originator, uh, a divine sort of being. Listen to this. Ancient texts and recent discoveries suggest that human civilization had once advanced to levels nearly as high as our own, maybe even every bit as high. The records are spotty, but information patterns are emerging to reveal that we have likely been here before. We've been in this place before. It's almost like sometimes we have a, 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 a collective deja vu that hits us and go, oh, whoa, haven't we done this before? And uh, then it would appear something happened. It seems possible that an extremely advanced worldwide civilization came crashing down in an apocalypse so thorough and, thorough and widespread that it nearly erased all memory of what has been. I remember talking with uh, Graham Hancock when he was at one of our Paradigm Symposiums, 
and he was mentioning this whole idea of do we have collective amnesia that we have forgotten these things now I've taken I've rabbit trailed off of something that I mentioned is that to accept some of this thing about holy language to accept some of this stuff about frequency about an originator a creator and all of these things a divine entity that is in control of all these things one that as we will talk a little bit later today uh, about the uh, the 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 Tower of Babylon, the dividing of languages, a cognitive act of a creative being who gave us an original language and then divided them for a purpose. I rabbit trailed off of that and said maybe there's something more there. Um, so, did the whole world? Do we have a a collective amnesia about things that happened to us in our past? Fragments of those memories are resurfacing now and again as we approach another zenith in human progress. As the puzzle pieces show up in mysterious and timely ways, we're forced to ask questions about who we are and what we're doing. And if maybe, just maybe, this time things might be different. And then we ask ourselves, well, why did I say that? This time things might be different. And among these hints and shadows of what might have come before, one warning stands out. When humans create a world that is widely out of, wildly out of sync with the laws of nature, disaster strikes with inevitable rebalance and, and, and an inevitable rebalancing occurs. We've created such a world and we have done so with blinding speed and momentum. It's almost as if the ant pile got kicked over 10,000 year, of years ago leaving just a few behind to rebuild things to wake to in the wake of some sort of disaster. But like ants do, we did rebuild, and the world that we've created seems to be reaching the tipping point once again. The world's religions and ancient wisdom traditions have various stories about what might have happened back then. Great floods a giant meteorite strike, a human-created technological disaster that may have involved worldwide conflict that ended in a nuclear-style bang or some invasion from external cosmic forces. The specifics aren't clear, and I'm not going to speculate about them in any particular story. In fact, as Joseph Campbell once said, literalism is idolatry. Think of that when we talked about uh, uh, the literalist... Uh, um, Orthodox Christian Church. Literalism is idolatry. To get wound up in details and chase around trying to prove or disprove anything would merely block us from seeing a pattern of information that is emerging and begs for our attention. And this information suggests that when humans unconsciously create, create, create out of fight or flight reaction to the forces of nature and each other, in an effort to secure our own safety, we ultimately develop a lopsided, out-of-balance situation that is doomed to implode. Think about that for a minute while we go into continuing to talk about universal language, something that was created and something for which has spread like, like the branches of a tree, everything in the universe, and everything under our hands of creation, under a creator and uh, an originator. So let's get into this when we get back. We'll dig a little deeper. You guys all sit tight. We'll be right back after this break.
Are you looking for a really awesome and amazing graphic designer? How about an illustrator or a photographer? This is Rainy Roberts, and I wanted to tell you how you can get my designer, illustrator husband, Scotty Roberts, to work for you on your project. Do you have an awesome self-published book but no cover, or even worse, a cover that really sucks? Do you need a kick-ass logo for your company or some f***ing awesome graphic designs for your ads or website? Then get in touch with my husband for the best f***ing awesome kick-ass design and illustration he knows his stuff and he's been at this for more years than i've been alive go to scottallenroberts.com that's scott with two t's a-l-a-n-r-o-b-e-r-t-s.com to take a look at his online portfolio of work or call 651-468-8115 now go out and kick some ass with some kick-ass graphic design hi i'm my dad so he can take me to disneyland Hey gang, welcome back after that break. This is Scotty Roberts. You're watching my show and listening to it over on the Odyssey Radio Network. This is the Intrepid Radio Program. Wow, I flipped those around. It's amazing. I said this a couple of times. So you can do something the same way every day, twice a day. I go through this opening announcement and uh, sometimes you get it wrong. So you're listening to my show, the Intrepid Radio Program, over on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O D Y. SY1.com. Come on over, see all the goodness that's Odyssey Radio and the different places where you can find this show in its archived audio form. You can also come over and watch the video simulcast over on my YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. Hit the subscribe button if you're on YouTube and the little bell icon so you can get notifications when the show comes on. And it's every day. So you can go over there and hit that. And uh, also, you can find the Join button either below this video or outside on my main page. You'll be able to click on that and see membership levels. There's three of them. Become a member of this page, join us, and see the different levels uh, that you can join and the perks that you get for joining. So, th And one of them is going to be again tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Wednesday, 6 a.m., we're going to do a... Just a lousy cup of coffee. Uh, and you can join us 6 a.m. Central Time, 7 a.m. Eastern Time. All the way over on the left coast, it's going to be 4 a.m. Lucky you. So uh, you can come in and join and chat uh, for coffee time. And that's members only. Membership has its privileges. So thanks uh, for being here. Let's continue on with what we were talking about. Uh, we were talking about this whole idea idea isn't the right word for it the whole theory i guess that uh, the earth was created the universe was created everything that is was created with universal language there is a holy sacred language that exists and uh, uh what we've seen so far are things that you have to let your faith click in a little bit to understand that there may be an originator, a creator, a God who did these things. Uh, it certainly seems that as if it was planned. You look at somebody like even Albert Einstein, and we quoted him, talked about the creator must have been this way to allow this and this and this to happen. He did have a belief that there was a sort of uh, um, um, original design to things. Um, I don't know if he took his, his faith beliefs any deeper than that. Uh, so uh, we end off this section by saying that perhaps to learn more about the power of the word, the spoken word, that word that we read in the book of John, we need to delve backwards a little bit into biblical scripture. And since this is the original source of the language that I believe has proven itself to be the original language, uh, and, and the first known reference, I think this will give us some insight. But let's look at the Tower of Babel. Now, we spent a few days, a few months back, talking about the Tower of Babel. Uh, does the biblical scripture, aside from Genesis chapter 1, actually teach us about the power of words, of the word, of language? And there's one particular place in the Bible that comes to mind, and many of us have already been familiar with it, and we familiarized ourselves with it when we talked about it. Here, what are you wearing on your head? I found it in a box. <laughs> Things that you would do 
with other people that you now have the boldness and the courage to do all on your own. Oh, and the dance is even better. <laughs> that goes with it. Come here. You got, you got to share it now, Rainy. So, talking about... And she's... It's my I'm Chris, talking away here. My Christmas switch hat. And I see her moving over there, and she's working over there, and she's got this hat on. Now, do your dance. Do your little dance. There you go. There you go. I need elf ears now. Yeah, you do. So, you're almost hiding behind your two loons logo there. There you go. <laughs> elf on a shelf. <laughs> is what comes to mind. I gotta get my stuff. Quit calling me over there. I gotta get my work done. Sorry. Sorry to have bothered orders. you so much. My order's packed. Am I bothering you? <laughs> no, that doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Folks, back to holy language from that. Uh, so there's one particular place in the Bible that speaks about language and the power of the word, and it comes to mind. And it's that familiar story that we've talked about here already. Uh, of the Tower of Babel. Babel, 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 Babeling. Um, is where we get that, those words, of course. Genesis 10.32. These are the families of the son of Noah, after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Genesis 11.1. 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Genesis 11.2 And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Verse 3 And they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had, a brick, had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And verse 4 And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They all have one language. And this they begin to do, and nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Verse 7. Go to, let us go down. Go to is the, the go to words here. For each one of these verses, go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Verse 8, so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. And verse 9 of chapter 11 of Genesis, therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confuse the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. Now, you have to wonder in this scene, why did God choose to confuse language? That doesn't make any sense to me. It says, if they keep doing and building this, there's not going to be anything they don't do. Wouldn't you want your creation to go, hey, I want to see my kids grow. I want to see them develop. I want to see what I want to sit back sometimes. Go, wow, let's see what you can achieve. And this was all based on making mud bricks and using mud slime to stick them together to build a tower that would reach to heaven. <laughs> so, is that what was really going on? We looked into that a bit uh, when we were in that series. That's, is that what was really going on? What was that a cover story for is the first question. Uh, and the second one is, why would God see his finite creation... Um, him so omnipotent and powerful above them, while they are like ants on the face of the earth, building a mud brick tower and say, whoa, if they keep building this tower together, there's nothing they ain't going to be able to do. I've got to confound them. That makes no sense to me. I want to know why. And there are a certain number of other things God could have done to punish them other than just confuse their language. And why are they being punished? They're being punished for building a brick tower and thinking that they can reach up into the heavens. Now, God and all his omniscience and omni omnipotence had to have known, well, they can't build a tower tall enough to reach outer space. She's over there mocking me. I, <laughs> I was dancing, sorry. I'm thinking about what I'm doing. She's dancing while I'm talking. It was almost to the words I was speaking. So she's doing other things. All right. 
There you go. Scintillating live recording. So, uh, Leslie, if you're listening, this is all while I'm packing up your stuff. Oh, Leslie, this is all for you. She's packing up your stuff, your order of stuff here. So, uh... <laughs> Happy dancing. Uh, she's happy dancing, and I'm okay with that. I just usually sit back and watch. So uh, things you would do uh, with other people that you are now find yourself I doing put, alone. Put good energy in all packages I ship out. She's putting good energy in all the packages she ships out. I wish you guys could all see this from my point of view here. Uh, looking over there. You just see her close up here. You see her way over there on her side of the studio doing her thing. I don't think I could even turn this, and it's such a disaster in here. And it, well, I got all my stuff that, all over. And things are in the way. My mic is in the way. All right, just flip this this whole unit around, and you could see what was going on. Moving on. So, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, for instance. The use of fire and brimstone. God did that to punish. Why is he confounding language? Is it possible that the destruction of the Tower of Babel was due to the corrupt use of the Hebrew language? Perhaps they may have incorporated the technical ability by using a specific Hebrew letter with resonating frequency to control the environment within that tower, and that ascended to great heights into the atmosphere. This specific Hebrew letter that they had incorporated was the Hebrew letter Pei, P-E-Y. Now, the Hebrew letter Pei means mouth, or issues out of the mouth. This has everything to do with the connection to speech and language and would explain the reason for why God chose to confuse language, though there was much more to this. Now, we do know that they certainly had the resources to build the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11:3 again. And they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. Now, science is discovering that the difference between sun-baked and fired bricks. Fire-baked bricks are much stronger. Firing the bricks at temperatures of 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit for 24 hours causes the clay particles to stick together, allowing for a much stronger material. Now, when I was in Egypt and John Ward and I went into the mud pits like the uh, Hebrew slaves of the Egyptians, and we stomped out mud, stomped uh, straw into uh, mud to make bricks, and we pour, took clumps of mud, threw them in wooden forms, smoothed them off, and removed the form, and you had a brick shape that dried in the sun for a day or two. And uh, that is the difference. Hold on. <laughs> Excuse me. Whew. Because it's a visual, I couldn't stop anything there. And those of you listening in audio, <laughs> happy day. There you go. Bless me. And so... They sunbaked these so they were stronger brick. And the strength of one of these single bricks can withstand about 6,000 pounds before it crumbles the brick. Now, this would have enabled them to build a tower almost two miles tall, uh, the way they would use the brick. Now, this is five times taller than the world's largest buildings today. So if they had the technical ability to build a tower that far up into the atmosphere... They may also have had the knowledge of frequency, along with the knowledge of employing the Hebrew letters to have an unbelievable colossal control over the whole environment. Now remember, we talked yesterday about frequency and its constructive and destructive power. Now, the problem with the tower project was that it wasn't authorized at that time by God. Not only was it not approved by God, in accordance with the scriptural story, but it might have also been hostile to the workings of nature by disrupting God's natural design and cycle. In other words, they were erroneously misusing this technology for their own self-centered means. Remember when we talked about uh, uh, the Ten Commandments and the commandment said, Thou shalt not use the name of the Lord thy God in vain, or you shall not use the private name of God for self Fulfilling and vain purposes is what that verse actually means. This is another uh, example of doing that kind of thing. They were misusing technology for their own self-centered means. They took advantage and overlooked the value and the importance of the natural workings and harmonization of the ecosystem that was created by God to be perfectly balanced. 
As the scriptures tell us, they sought to do whatever they wanted with such controlling power that it would eventually dominate and destroy the environment. How about that? I never got that out of the Tower of Babel story. I thought they were just building a tower. Building a brick tower. It says in Genesis 11:6, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. And again, I'm back to that question. Why did God not want to allow them to spread their wings and learn and do things? Now, this may have been the real reason, the critical decision, for why God had intervened by confusing the sole source of their power, language, the power of words. This assumption that the Tower of Babel employed the power of the Hebrew language by utilizing the frequency of the letter Hebrew pe can be seen in its overall design in the ziggurats, and some of, the, some of those we still have left today, better known as a terraced pyramid. And archaeologists have found ziggurats in southern Mesopotamia, which is associated with the city of Babel, uh, the plain of Shinar. In addition, Babel is also known as Babylon, which is now modern-day Iraq. And they were called ziggurats because they zigzagged in design following an alternating, alternating course which gave the appearance of a tilting effect. And the spiraling inside is not structurally the case. This spiraling effect only occurs with each stage of a staircase that reaches to the next stage in building the staircase. And these staircases are on alternating sides and they kind of zigzag like this, up and down. So that when you have reached the top, you've traveled right around the tower. Thus, a spiral staircase is the true design of the tower. So nearly 30 ziggurats in the area of Mesopotamia have been discovered by archaeologists. And in location, they stretch from Mari and Tel Brak in the north and uh, Dur Sharukan uh, uh, in the north to Ur and Eridu in the south and to Susa and Koga Zambil in the east. Now, we've mentioned a couple of these already, Ur and Eridu. <coughs> Ur is the, uh, um, the city that Abraham came from, Abraham, the father of the Israelites the Israelite nation. He came from Ur in the Chaldees. And Eridu is associated with King Atrahasis from the cuneiform text, the, the tale of Atrahasis, who called out to his god Enki to come and help him, and that was the city of Eridu. And the structure at Eridu is the, el the earliest observed structure that's designated as a ziggurat, and it's dated in its earliest level to the Ubaid period, which is estimated around 4,300 to 3,500 years old. However, its dates are still a matter of uncertainty. But in essence, this is a ziggurat's structural design. The, uh, it goes almost, uh, it starts in the center. It would be good if I had a graphic and I don't. And it goes around and around itself like this and gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it, as it grows upward, frankly. So the Hebrew letter pay signifies a mouth by way, by, by way of speech, and therefore language. Hence, the power issued out of the mouth. It was spoken. And we shouldn't overlook the power of the Hebrew letter pay, since the first word spoken by mouth was God. Let there be light. And Genesis 1, 3, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And this is the evidence of great power, for God spoke and the world came into being. Can you imagine the power that one could possess to create like God? Is this something that perhaps with uh, Adam and Eve and the serpent figure character in the garden, Nokosh, uh, where God said, the humans have eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and have become just like us. Let us therefore prevent them from also eating of the tree of life, lest they become like gods and immortal. And so uh, this is interesting. So it becomes even clearer to the tower's ability um, that when God said, let there be light, this is evidence of that power. 
The Bible phrase in Genesis 11:6 6 says, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they will begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And so this becomes clear. The people could do as they wanted, and this was in a self-aggrandizing way, impersonating God. And they were, in a sense, mimicking the power of God's mouth. The power of speaking something into existence. Now, the inner space of the letter Pe reveals the Hebrew letter Bet. And uh, Bet, remember, Bet comes around and it goes, it basically looks like this. It comes around this way and down, uh, I'm sorry, this way and down and over. And the letter Pe starts here and comes around this way. So it's almost the same letter. And it reveals the Hebrew letter Bet. And since the first letter of the Torah, B, Bet, from the word Barashith, which represents the house of creation, the letter Bet within the Pe represents the word of God that created heaven and earth. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So in other words, the very first Hebrew letter of the Torah is an exact picture that the Word of God is the agency behind the entire universe. The Bet is within the Pe, which is the letter associated with the Tower of Babel. And by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Psalm 33, 6. So as an end result, this manifestation of the world, of world domination had its hour. For all those who were seduced by God's glorious power and position in the awesome arrangement of his works and abused them were befuddled by the confusion of language. And so the great tower project had come to a dead halt as a testimony to, for all to recount, God's mastery over mankind is greatest and shall always prevail, is what the message of that was supposed to be from God. Can't mimic me. You can't try to do things. You can't try to use the same power, if you will, that magical power that lies within the words to do something. I'm going to confound that. And he confounded it. So, do you wish to rise, to begin descending? By, de by descending, you plan a tower that will pierce the clouds. Lay first the foundation of humility. That's what St. Augustine said about all of this. So, you can also look at an example like the Great Pyramid. One may wonder where did the initial idea for the Tower of Babel originate? The people of Shinar must have acquired this knowledge from somebody prior to them, or they just make this stuff up on their own. Now, in my research, and we've talked about this, I examined the book of Enoch, reaching into the arsenals of the biblical scripture, or rather outside of the canonized Old and New Testaments. And my personal belief, aside from what the scholars might say, is that Enoch is probably the oldest book in human history, dating back approximately 5,000 years. Not the writings of Berossus in the 4 to 500s BCE, but the book itself in its original form was at least 5,000 years old. It was originally written in Hebrew. The following is from Alexander the Great when he was in India. I'm talking about Alexander in the 300s BCE. When I came to such a place in India, the natives told me that they had with them the sepulchre of an ancient king that ruled over all the world, whose name was Canaan. Just like the land of Canaan. It was Cain, like Adam and Eve's son, C-A-I-N-A-N, -A -N, which is the same word as Canaan, C-A-N-A-A-N, -A -A the son of Enoch, who, foreseeing that God would bring a flood upon the earth, wrote his prophecy of it on tables of stone. And they're here, and the writing is Hebrew writing. That's what Alexander the Great had to say. However, even though Enoch is mentioned in the Bible inexplicably, inexplicably 
uh, inexplicably, there we go, try three, uh, his books have been excluded from the Bible. Some of these documented texts concerning Enoch were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, proving that they were not penned at a later date, as some people claim. There were excerpts of it within the Dead Sea Scrolls. Others written in Greek texts before the languages of Latin and Roman were translated from Jewish circles when they created the Septuagint. And it's been estimated that the Book of Enoch is quoted at least 128 times in the New Testament. There's also an Ethiopic and Slavonic version. The book consists of five distinct sections as it follows. The Book of the Watchers, the Book of the Parables or the Similitudes, the Book of the Heavenly Luminaries, also called the Astronomical Book, the Book of Dreams, and the Epistle of Enoch. Now, the Book of Enoch was very popular and was widely circulated and accepted in Jesus' era. In fact, we find Jesus indirectly referring and quoting passages from the Book of Enoch. Later, it leads to the reason why the Book of Enoch was excluded from the Bible. It was later rejected and abandoned by the Jews because it contained prophecies pertaining to Jesus as the Messiah, which they considered to be blasphemous, that a man could possess the embodiment of God. So we know this because it was documented by many of the early church fathers. Arthenagoras, Clement of Alexandria, Irenaeus, and Tertullian, they wrote that the book of Enoch had been rejected by the Jews because it contained prophecies pertaining to Jesus. Now, some even suggest that the book of Enoch was excluded because it was too esoteric in nature for the early church, or as I would say, it's the Old Testament on crack. And so, we even find Jude, who was an apostle of Jesus, quoting from the book of Enoch, pertaining to Jesus as being the Messiah, Jude 1, 14 through 15, and Enoch 1, 9. And it's not just Jude and Jesus quoting from the book of Enoch, but uh, moreover, it was what Enoch said in his book coincides perfectly, almost word for word, with most of the prophets of the Old and the New Testament concerning the Messiah. So the book of Enoch combined with the Old and the New Testament is a canonized book that prophetically repeats itself. And to this end, we've been reading the same scriptures for years over and over again, telling the same message, yet somehow in the anthology of biblical doctrine we failed to perceive it. Enoch is the pivotal key to the whole mystery of the ages. But sadly, Enoch is the greatest story never told. But who was Enoch? Why is he being obscured? and blotted out from mainstream knowledge and history. You know what? We're going to have to hit that tomorrow. It's a pretty cool thing. I got too much to jump into it tonight. So we started talking about the Book of Enoch. There's a lot that I want to cover about this holy language and how it relates to Enoch and how, well, Enoch was the seventh generation from Adam, so on, so on, so on, so on. There's so much information here and so much scripture here to talk about the book of Enoch that we've got to save it for tomorrow. And uh, so I hope you enjoyed this. You got to tune in tomorrow when we hit this stuff on Enoch. It's going to be really interesting, exciting stuff. So thanks for being here, folks. Become a member if you haven't been. Hit that join button. And uh, we'll see you in about 23 hours. Have a nice night.